Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. Thank you. A town climbing to new heights of quality and achievement. Just imagine the serial capital of the world, Battle Creek, Michigan. We're known as the health city and the international city, but the development of the ready-to-eat cereal business in the early 1900s and over 40 cereal manufacturers helped give us the title that's still with us today, cereal capital of the world. If you've ever eaten a bowl of cereal, chances are you can thank the city of Battle Creek, Michigan. William Kellogg first invented cornflakes while working at the city's sanitarium in 1896. Shortly after, Charles Post founded his own cereal company in town. Unlike other towns such as Detroit and Flint, who lost their primary businesses, Battle Creek has retained Kellogg's and Post still has a large factory as well. But in the 1980s, Michigan was in a troubled state. 1982 saw a record high unemployment level of over 17 percent. The state budget had undergone cuts of totaling 778 million dollars. This time was also the beginning of what would eventually become known as Satanic Panic. Satanic cults and how they impact our families, our children, and our communities. The Satanists believe that good is evil and evil is good. It is in fact a symbol of degenerate behavior and this is part of our problem. I don't know who's behind it but it's happening. For 666, and it's used in the universal product of. Seventh generation satanic worshiper. There are many crimes that are unsolved in our cities, and many of those crimes have ritualistic overtones. In 1980, Canadian psychologist Lawrence Pazdar and his then patient and future wife Michelle Smith released the book Michelle Remembers, an alleged biography of the woman's ritual satanic abuse as a child. The book was a bestseller. Serial killers and the occult were in front page news. The public was frightened, and in 1982, the citizens of Battle Creek would see the first of three young women brutally murdered in the span of just seven months. Did a serial killer stalk Serial City? This goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. And the serial killer known as the Doodler. There could be a serial killer in Chicago. A Long Island serial killer. Phantom Killer. Jack the Ripper. The Oakland County Child Killer. The Atlanta Murders Case. The Freeway Phantom. Frankfurt Slasher. Four children have now been murdered. He has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Fifteen brutally murdered young women. The 24th victim. The pattern is the same. One by one. The death count started rising. Serial killing. I think it's at epidemic proportion. Man in a mask robbed, tied, and stabbed them. Strength stuck in burlap bags. Disemboweled in this alley. It is highly unlikely that these women were murdered by separate men. Where will the killer strike next? They still do not know who's responsible. They kill simply because they like it. Serial killers keep killing. Police can't answer who or why. That's the question that we'll never know. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering if this person's going to be caught. I hope they'll get answers one day. I believe that there's someone out there that has knowledge. Zodiac said he shall never be caught, and he's probably still at large. These are the River Apartments, located in the northern edge of Battle Creek city limits. It is where 20-year-old Maggie Hume moved with her roommate in May 1982. The ex-cheerleader and National Honor Society member had just graduated from Kellogg Community College and was working as a secretary at a local doctor's office by August. On the morning of August 18th, Maggie, always on time, didn't show up for work. After continuously getting a busy signal, her co-workers phoned her boyfriend, Virgil J. Carter, and her brother John Hume. The pair went to apartment 19 and entered, finding Maggie's alarm clock still ringing. The phone was off the hook and Maggie's glasses were on her shelf, glasses the girl desperately needed to be able to see with. The two called the police who came to investigate. It was then that they found Maggie. She was stuffed inside a sleeping bag beneath some clothing in her closet. Suspicion immediately fell upon Jay, who had been looking inside the closet first and claimed not to see anything. Furthermore, he had been with Maggie the night prior until about 11.30 p.m. Her roommate, Margaret Van Winkle, had phoned during that time to say she would not be getting in until 4.30 a.m. A pair of grass-stained footprints were found on this power box that the killer climbed on to hoist himself up onto the apartment balcony. 
Those footprints then led directly into Maggie's room and directly out again, meaning not only did the murder happen in a five hour window when she was alone, but the killer also knew her exact room. Besides Jay and Margaret, the only other person who might have known was Maggie's ex-boyfriend Jim Downey, who had phoned that night while Jay was there. Jay was described as a possessive boyfriend who openly flirted with Maggie's friends. Even at her funeral, he made passes at some of the grieving women. Jay also said some strange things. He told them that Maggie had been raped and strangled before the coroner's report told the police this information. Both Jay and Maggie's ex-boyfriend were given polygraph tests. Both failed. The ex-boyfriend demanded a second test, which he passed. Jay did not ask for another test. It was also noted at one point during the test he became silent and bowed his head, body language that commonly signals a forthcoming confession. Unfortunately, this coincided with one of the technicians entering the room and he snapped out of it. With no physical evidence to pin on Carter, the case went cold. 17-year-old Patricia Rosansky left her home on South Broad Street to walk to nearby Battle Creek Central High School. Her route would take her onto Capitol Avenue and then up to Calhoun Street. Patricia had been living with her brother and his wife after their mother had died six years prior and the group had moved to Battle Creek from New Jersey in 1982. Patricia and a friend were just a block away from school when they spotted some classmates that her friend stopped to smoke a cigarette with. Patricia continued on, but never made it to school. Next, we travel 13 miles northeast of Battle Creek to the village of Bellevue. On the evening of March 13th, 17-year-old Carrie Evans left her grandparents' home here to take a walk along Main Street. Evans had moved in within the month prior from her mother's house in Manchester, Michigan. Unlike the other two girls, Carrie's childhood hadn't been as pleasant. She had gotten into routine trouble and, as would become a major deal in the case, was interested in the occult. This is the north branch of the Kalamazoo River. It runs from the river apartments two miles down to this area. The woods on the north bank are used as an unofficial trash dump. It was April 6, 1983, when two people searching for scrap metal found the body of Patricia Rosansky hidden underneath leaves and branches in a shallow gully full of trash. One of her mittens was still frozen to the ground she had gripped during the struggle. Heavy blows from a cylindrical object such as a tire iron had crushed her skull. Like Hume, she had been sodomized. A nearby napkin had semen on it, and in her hand was a clump of hair. Police now had a second murder on their hands, and before they even knew it, a third body turned up. A mushroom hunter was walking the grounds of the Kellogg Sportsman's Club just outside of Bellevue when he found Carrie Evans' body. Like Rosansky, she had been raped, strangled, and her partially nude body was covered with debris. As the investigation began, Street Talk linked Rosansky's murder to a satanic cult. One of the main suspects was a Satanist who supposedly led black masses in Kalamazoo. Furthermore, Evans had a red jacket with 666 on the back. At this point, the infamous McMartin Preschool case was fresh in the news, and the citizens of Battle Creek panicked that a cult was murdering their children. It is during this panic that 17-year-old Mary Ann Davidson disappeared. The high school senior was last seen leaving her job at the former Mr. Don's restaurant here. Her car was still in the parking lot. A massive search was launched and over 50 citizens called in with information. Finally, a tip paid off. Mary was tracked to a hotel in Cheektowaga, New York, where she is shacked up with a group of traveling magazine salesmen. She had left voluntarily with them and was noted as promising to send weekly letters to her parents about how she was. While this comical event was the last of the missing girls, the story of the Battle Creek killings was far from over. This is WUHQ-TV 41, an ABC affiliate. 
serving Battle Creek, Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, and all of West Michigan. The following year, the local Crime Stoppers aired a special show profiling the Hume and Rosansky murders, doubling their normal reward fee of $2,500. The Hume family added another $10,000 to that reward. Tips from this show led police to 29-year-old Thomas Kress. Six separate witnesses claimed he told them a very accurate description of how he killed Rosansky. Kress also lived in a house located here where the new high school stadium is located, almost exactly where the girl was last seen. The only problem was Kress had an alibi for the time of the murder, nor did his hair match what was found in her hand. Despite there being zero physical evidence and one of the tipsters later admitting to lying for the money, Thomas Kress, a man with the mental capacity of an 8-year-old, was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Patricia Rosansky. One year later, police received word that serial killer Michael Ronning was arrested in Arkansas for the similar rape and murder of Diana Henley. He admitted to killing several other women in different states and had also lived directly beneath Maggie Hume in 1982, moving out the day after her murder. Battle Creek detectives tried to interview him in 1987, but Ronning refused. It would not be until 1992 that they made him a deal. If Ronning would confess to any murders in the area he committed, he would be transferred back to Michigan where his family lived. Finally, in 1996, Ronning was flown up to give his confession for three homicides, Hume, Rosansky, and Evans. Things looked good for the case, until Ronning started talking. In the Hume murder, Ronning claimed to have gone down to the river to fish that night. Coming back, he watched Hume through a window near the complex's maintenance shed. This was the area that Maggie's wallet was found in a pile of grass clippings in 1983. But there's an issue with this statement. Maggie's apartment is on the northern side of the complex. Ronning and the clipping pile is on the southern side. There are three buildings between that area. He also claimed he entered the apartment through a window when it was known the intruder entered and exited the door. In the Rosansky case, he claimed she did not put up any sort of struggle and was killed with a rock before he left the body on perfectly flat land. Four separate family members told detectives that Ronning admitted to lying about the murders just to get the deal and he was sent back to Arkansas. Another strange twist would come in 2008 when Mark Allen Schmidt was arrested for robbing a bank in Ann Arbor. Immediately before the robbery, Schmidt entered the police station and complained he was having trouble acclimating to society after 15 years in prison. Upon his arrest, he would shock police further by confessing to the murder of Carrie Evans. Mark had been a suspect during the initial investigation and was interviewed in prison in 2004 when the Evans case was reopened, but nothing came of his interview. Schmidt later admitted that he had confessed to get more prison time, as he did not want to be a free man. In 2005, Maggie Hume's case was reopened. Upon reinvestigation, police recommended prosecuting Virgil J. Carter. It was not pursued because his DNA was not found under her fingernails and Ronning is still on the books as confessing. Virgil still lives in Battle Creek with his wife. He's an engineer at a local manufacturing plant and avid bicyclist. Thomas Kress was released from prison in 2010 after serving 25 years. In a routine housekeeping schedule, the hair and semen from Rosansky's case was destroyed in 1992 after Kress's appeals were exhausted. Three young women, all having just recently moved to their homes. Rosansky and Hume attended the same church. Rosansky and Evans were mentioned to have been murdered by cults. Despite these similarities, none of the three deaths are officially linked, and despite a confession in each murder, they are all unsolved. Whether or not they are truly linked, whether it is a single killer or a cult, someone in Battle Creek, Michigan got away with murder. To new information and the story that we first brought you last night, Governor Granholm 
commuted the sentence of a convicted murderer yesterday. After 25 years behind bars, Thomas Kress be set free. Danny Carlson spoke with Patty Rosansky's family about what they think about the governor's actions. Just about an hour ago, I got off the phone with Patty's brother, John. Kress's commutation is just making his family relive the nightmare over again. Rosansky says he believes Kress raped and killed his sister nearly 30 years ago. Thomas Kress has maintained his innocence for the 25 years he has been behind bars. Another man, convicted murderer Michael Ronning, admitted to killing Patty Rosansky and two other young women. My opinion, like I said, would be is that, you know, there is still, to me, a murderer still out there. I stayed there all along. Uh, I'll stay till the day I die. I didn't do the crime.